Welcome to all of you. We had over 400 of you registered and, and the number is climbing right now. So welcome to our 2020 Sailor Series program, our continuation here in a virtual reality that we're all living in. I want to make note that this Sailor Series this year has been dedicated in loving memory to our dear Louis Howland. Um, and while I suspect many of you would rather be on your boats right now, or certainly at least out of your homes, we're so glad to have you with us here tonight. We are immensely grateful for the support of Ruth and Hope Atkinson and the Samuel D. Rositsky Lecture Fund. Their support has made this lecture free. Um, in fact, for the last two months, the museum has worked very hard to pivot quickly and deliver our content virtually and free of charge. <coughs> And so with that, I would ask you if you are able to, if you'd be so kind to think of the museum and, and consider making a gift to our annual fund, you can send along a check or you can certainly do that online if you're so inclined. We thank you in advance for considering that. I want to thank our partners who really helped share the word on the Sailors series and we're so grateful to be working with the Cruising Club of America, the New Bedford Yacht Club, the Beverly Yacht Club, and Tabor Academy. We're very excited to hear from you, Anna, and we will get to that in two seconds. Before I turn it over, I just really want to make one of our trustees, a longtime trustee at the Whaling Museum. Joe's passion for the museum is really unparalleled, and um, I really want to thank Joe in particular. He also doubles as our treasurer and our chair of our finance committee, and we've put him to a lot of work this past couple of weeks in helping the museum navigate this difficult time. So I want to thank Joe for that. And with that, Joe, I will turn it over to you and Anna. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. It's a real pleasure to introduce Anna. Obviously, he doesn't need much of an introduction. Chosen to join us tonight, and that has to do with his reputation, I'm sure. As many of you know, Anna's nautical photography is simply amazing and his presentation style certainly brings his photos to life. I've been a fan of Anna's photos for many, many years and can't count the number of times I said, this is my favorite. What you may not know is that Anna grew up in South Africa. As a teenager, he began sailing small boats and working on commercial fishing boats. Boating was his passion, but his father thought he needed a job skill. So he spent three years in a mission. Ironically, it was that job skill that enabled him to talk his way aboard Flyer for the 1981-82 Whitbread around the world race, and they won. So he's certainly a sailor. But Anna has also had a camera aboard, and he launched his career as a nautical photographer from the end of Flyer's spinnaker pole in the top of its mast. So let's get on with the program. Anna likes questions, so please use the chat feature on Zoom. Anna, it's your turn to sail America. Thank you, Joe. Um, everybody can hear working? Okay, good, perfect. Good, well, um, thank you everybody for signing in and, and showing up. Um, this is, you know, quite an honor to get over 400 people signing up. You know, and in today's day where crazy times, we don't know exactly where we're going with it all, what's gonna happen, and I'm glad that at least we're able to still meet like this virtually through Zoom most of the time. And um, about my book um, and what we see on the screen now is the first book that I did with Rizzoli. And it's, it was called Sailing. We ended up publishing this particular book in 2013. We did seven reprints and we ended up doing 14,000 copies which is respectable for a $100 coffee table book. And so the publisher, this sort of, that particular book came to an end and they stopped printing it. And uh, I'm gonna make sure my screen works, this is good. So the publisher at Rizzoli said to me, Anna, we would love to do another book with you. Sailing has done so well, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna do Sailing Europe? Are we going to do um, wooden boats or what are we going to do? And Tenley, my wife and I were driving back from Oregon where we had dropped off our boy who lives out there. And these are the kind of scenes that we had on this beautiful drive. And, you know, Tenley, we had got in a 
with two two road highways, two lane highways of America. So we really avoided the interstates. And this is what we saw most of the time. And we were talking about what are we going to do? You know, and these were the scenes that were appearing. And I was just blown away because I'd never done the east to west drive in the United States. And actually parts of it reminded me of the wheat fields of South Africa. And while we were talking about this, you know, this type of scenery and, you know, sort of thinking, wow, it's stunning. This came to mind and the Heart of America Challenge for the 1987 America's Cup for the Chicago Yacht Club. And I started thinking, you know, we should not go beyond the United States with a book, but keep it local. And, and there are so many different people that sail. And this was sort of a shot that I looked at these two little boats and I thought to myself, I think we should do a book called Sailing America. And it's, it's going to, I really want to show the far corners of the country, the weird little spots that people say, I had no idea they had boats there or that they sailed. So this is Jenny Lake in the Tetons, in the Teton National Park. And um, we ended up during the trip emailing the publisher and saying, how about sailing in Amer sailing America? And he's like, good idea. Gathering material. And, um, you know, this show tonight's going to show you what we had in stock, what we had to shoot, go out and shoot. And it was, we had basically two summers to fill in what I didn't have in the archive. So um, this, we start off in Wickford, Rhode Island, just, you know, 15 minute drive from where I live here in Jamestown, Rhode Island. And of course, our gallery is just across the bridge in Newport. A lovely cat boat, a nice fall, October, November scene here in Rhode Island. So, you know, you've got to include everything. And, you know, it's not always J boats and, you know, whatever big massive fleets of Malgus 24s or and I had to include the Fool's Rules Regatta which is here in Jamestown once a year every summer hope we have it this summer um, and of course it's a contest of whatever floats and goes from A to B the fastest they have a little you know downwind race and they you have the whole morning to build these boats and I mean how often do you see a guy with a couch and then there's a second floor with the kids so then, and then it's off to Cuddy Hunk Harbor uh, in the Elizabeth Islands, just a wonderful cruising destination for us New Englanders. Uh, from Newport, it's about 22, 23 odd miles, so not very far to haul across. This was just at sunrise as, you know, the sun is coming up and dead quiet, nobody else out there. I always take some camera gear with me when we go cruising on our sailboat. And then who doesn't know this place, the Oar at Block Island, which is a wonderful watering hole. You you know pick up a mooring in the inner harbor and um, take the launch or putts ashore to the Oar and go and have a couple of drinks and see if you can find your boat back in the thing. little hike. Then it's off to the Shelter Island Yacht Club, which I'm actually standing on their dock and looking across at an amazing fleet of twelve and a half. Um, these are obviously small Harishoff boats, and they have a big fleet there. I've never seen so many in one place. It was quite remarkable. And then we sailed across, and this is all the cruising that we did uh, a couple summers ago um, on my Pearson 36, which I restored, which is called Snook. And we had anchored in Stone, and then I took my little 10-foot dink and went shooting and what a, just a pleasure to do that to go late light beer can shooting um you know just me and myself and irene as they would say i was just in the little chase boat myself putzing through the fleet very quietly and peaceful great great late light the oliver hazard perry at 200 feet overall length and 130 foot on the spars uh, she spends a lot of time in Newport as that's her home base. And so this is just a shot looking up the rig and one of the guys. But it's also birds that pick a ride on this vessel. This is also on the Oliver Hazard Perry and this is a little chickadee. You know, the belaying pins, the halyards and the sheets are just, you know, beautiful 
to photograph and to see, and the boat is in such good shape. So this is the Oliver Hazard Perry, um, and she is based in Newport, and it's a training vessel for school kids and all this type of thing. And the, and the boat came here um, sort of half completed. They bought her in Canada and finished the boat off in Rhode Island. And she's now the official flagship. So this was taken during the Classic Yacht Regatta in Newport. And this is Tilly. She's a Sunder Klasse One design. She was designed in 1898 for the Keeler Yacht Club. And uh, they ended up building quite a lot of boats all over the world. And she became a fairly popular one design class. Even Herishoff in Bristol built a bunch of them. So this was actually taken, these two shots were taken during one of my workshops where I take a bunch of um, students, photo students, 10, 15, 16, and we charter a 50 foot lobster boat and we go and shoot. So it's clear before we started, the wooden boat regattas are really very dear to, dear to me. I love shooting wooden boats. Here we have Northern Light on the left hand side. She's a 1938 Sparkman Stevens design. And Glean, US 11 on the right is a Clinton Crane design, also of the same vintage. Two beautiful wooden 12 meters. And I've done a lot of work with those guys when Bob Tiedemann was still alive uh, with, with Elizabeth working, doing their photography, their PR stuff. It was just a wonderful time. This again is Glean heading off on starboard tack in a southwesterly sea breeze heading towards the the tip, the northern tip of Goat Island. Not Goat Island, Rose Island. Goat Island is under the bridge. So, Ona, Ona, tell us a little bit about light, and because you do such a great job of using the morning and the evening light, and this is a good example. So I'll go back, and of course, this is the, the picture you're talking about, Joe, right? It's the one the, the uh, light. by bridge, yeah. With yeah, the, this. Well, yeah. And obviously the best light is early in the morning and late in the day. And that is because you don't get such contrasty light. If you shoot in the middle of the day, well, they're white and very hard to work with. Unfortunately, regattas are, you know, they start at 11 and they finish at 2.30 or 3 o'clock. Well, it's the worst part of the day. But in, in this show, a little later on, you'll see a, an event that I shot on Narragansett Bay that started really late because the breeze didn't fill in. So the, the beautiful thing, you know, when I work for advertising clients, I say, well, we'll start at five in the morning or 4.30 and we'll shoot till about eight and then we'll take a break and, you know, have lunch and all this and we'll, and we'll carry on at three o'clock and they say, whoa, what a waste of time. I was like, no, it's not actually, you know, we have to um, catch the right light. Anna, I have a question. Actually, it's one of our participants' uh, questions. Eric Thorkelson, one, oh, yes. Aaron, sorry, Aaron Thorkelson is wondering if you have a favorite photo that you've ever taken and what would it be <laughs> and why? Do I have a favorite photo? Yes, I do. There are quite a few, um, but it's, at, unfortunately, the, because we are so tied into the book theme, that some of the favorite shots that I have um, are not in the show and it would be nice to talk about them. But it's, it's really about, and there are some shots in this that I feel strongly about. And, and as I come across them, Erin, um, I'll talk about it a little and just ping me back again. But, you know, when you've been uh, on Narragansett Bay and other parts of the sailing world, uh, you come across a lot of beautiful imagery and it's it's hard to sort of really delineate between one or two or three, but I have a handful. Um, so we're looking here at the 12 meter KZ-5, also known as plastic, uh, you know, the plastic fantastics. They were designed by three Kiwis in 1986. And the advantage of them going from aluminum, well, obviously originally the tall to wood, then aluminum, and then fiberglass was that these boats were much, much stiffer than the aluminum boats so they could get better head state tension and stuff like that. So these boats, the 12s are about 65 feet long for those of you that are not familiar with 12 meter racing. And we have in on Narragansett Bay here, we have a fleet of probably at times 12 or 13 boats that live between Bristol and Warren and Newport. So we're very fortunate. This is the Bruce King design Scheherazade. 
uh, a large 165 foot boat that was built in Maine. Uh, and here she is sailing on Frenchman's Bay. Um, I was asked to photograph this boat. I spent many a time shooting. I'm just going to make a thing. Okay. So Shahrazad is a cold molded boat and um, just an amazing boat to shoot. And here again, I'm using late light. You can see this is late in the afternoon. We've got a little bit of a southwesterly breeze coming down the sound. And um, I spent a lot of time in this area around Southwest Harbor, shooting for Hinckley, shooting for Morris, and then for Hodgson as well. I went back later on for Hodgson and did some of their power boat, worked with Comanche, which I'll talk about later on. So this is also up in uh, Southwest Harbor on Soam Sound in the area of where Hinckley has their, their original facility. And, um, you know, some mornings it would be foggy and there was no breeze and we were trying to shoot sailboats, Hinkley sailboats in those days. And so the art director, you know, Marnie Reed would say, well, let's give it a break and let's get back together at nine or 10 and see if we can maybe shoot later on in the afternoon when the breeze does kick in. So I'd take off and keep my, you know, cell phone switched on. But go and look at these different, this is beautiful stock stuff just type of imagery uh, for calendars and books and all that. So as I said, this is Southwest Harbor, Maine. Anna, uh, we have a question from uh, Mark Orbe. He, he says, what is the one recommendation you would make to amateur photographers to enhance their nautical photographic skill? <laughs> you got to come and do one of my workshops, of course. You got to come down to Newport and jump on the boat with 15 of us and then we go and shoot. We do some late afternoon classes and we do some theory in the classroom, um, but that's a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, this is not a sales pitch for my workshops, but of course you'd be welcome. But you obviously need to have a chase boat to get out there. And like I said, late light, early light, with a little sunshine and tons of practice. I can never overemphasize how much one needs to practice to get this type of work right. Uh, it's bumpy, it's wet, it's, it's just, you know, it's tough to get out there and especially with a long lens, keep everything steady and dry and lenses clean and all that stuff. And uh, you got to shoot at least once or twice a week to sort of get the ball rolling and stay at it and work at it. Anna, we do have another question from Ernie Godschalk um, asking where yes. the name yes. of your boat comes from. Ah, so are you talking about the name of the chase boat on assignment or the name of my sailboat Snook? I believe, so it, I believe it's Snook. And I, okay. I would recommend everybody that they uh, just Google Second Wind and Anna Vanderwall and you'll, they'll find the PBS Rhode Island broadcast uh, <laughs> film on the refit of your boat, which is fascinating. Right. Um, they did a very nice PBS, Rhode Island PBS today, a uh, beautiful documentary about it. And, um, and Snook is in there. And the name Snook of my boat is, it's a fish that is caught in South Africa. It's a saltwater fish, just like a barracuda. But as a teenager, I spent a lot of time catching Snook and loved it. And at times not even, I couldn't go to school and I had to go and fish. So Snook it plays a big part in my life. And I got some pictures of my boat later on in this slideshow. Um, here we are off Goat Island, beautiful late light. This was, I was telling you earlier, a regatta that started at afternoon because the breeze hadn't built. And um, these guys shy reaching towards the bridge. And this is the, uh, the Resolute Cup, the New York Yacht Club sonars racing in the Resolute Cup. And here a little different angle, a little bit of a shy reach here, shy kites, not a ton of breeze, but a nice angle. And for me, the light was perfect. And for those of you that are interested in photography, um, I was just shooting this, this particular scene with a new camera called the R, the Canon EOS R. And this was a couple summers ago being announced and Canon sent me a sort of a prototype. And I was, I was pretty, it was pretty fun stuff to try something completely new. So here we have uh, the mighty Comanche. What an amazing machine. Um, this was built for John, Jim Clark. 
of Netscape fame. And Kenny Reed was obviously instrumental in, in putting the project together and getting it built in time with Kimo Worthington. And they just had a star-studded show of guys sailing this amazing boat. Um, she's 100 feet, and this is the start of the transatlantic race a few years ago. And she set a new 218 nautical miles. So just for those of you that have done the Bermuda race on smaller boats, um, this boat could do that in 24 hours if the breeze is right. That puts it into perspective. This again is uh, Comanche on the windward side and the start of the transatlantic record attempt, not an attempt, it was the race, but she set a new record of five days and 14 hours to cross the Atlantic, uh, making it an average speed of 25 knots. Not a ton of, not a ton of guys on board. I think she has some power assisted winches, but still big boat. So, uh, uh, working environment, do photos with moisture on the lens ever make the final cut, or is it always a spoiler? No, you know, the I don't get a lot of real serious wet, you know, spray on my lens. My twenty-five foot rib on assignment is a very, very dry ride. It's, it's incredible. And I do get a little bit of fine mist. Actually, the worst time is if you're on the leeward side of a sailboat and a little behind, and there's some wind coming off the, some spray coming off the leeward bow that then gets sucked up in the vortex in the air, and then I get that on my front element. So that just takes a little wipe down. I'm constantly wiping it down. But um, yeah, and a little bit of spray on the on the lens. Yeah, it, it doesn't seem to really bother it, you know. So, good question though. Anna, we have a few more questions that might actually pertain to you know how you shoot. Um, yeah. Quinton McMullen is asking, do you shoot digitally or do you shoot raw? Well, um, I shoot digitally in raw. So raw is a certain format, and for those of you that are not tech savvy with the way we're shooting nowadays, but you either shoot a JPEG or you can shoot a RAW. And the RAW file is much, it has so much more information once you put it into a computer to kick out the final JPEG. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because otherwise we're going to be here till nine o'clock, but it's a <laughs> wonderful question. And um, if you're ever interested in sitting in on one of the classes, we do a lot of talking about this type of process and, and how I work RAW files. Uh, here is the, the Transpac race. This is actually, these guys won the Transpac race with Stan Honey. This is Comanche. Uh, they won the Transpac race, and that's a 2,225-mile 2, 2, race in five and a half days. And this shows you a little bit of the power of the boat. She's 25 feet on the beam. Uh, she's won the Sydney Hobart race, and she's now owned by a Russian syndicate which is unfortunate that she's left uh, Narragansett Bay because it was just always wonderful seeing these guys sell this big beast around here. We're off to the J-Class Worlds. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked by the class to shoot the event, which we had here two, three summers ago. And we had five of these beautiful 140-foot sloops. And this is Hanuman, owned by Jim Clark, also who also owned Comanche. And Kenny was also in charge of this project, and of course the helmsman. And here's a helicopter shot. Uh, notice how big the North Sales logos are. North and the guys on the bow ready to get the, the kite down. This is JH1, a, a Dutch entry, Lionheart, a new build. So I'm going to take you through a little sequence here, which I just love the sequence and. Obviously, we can't hear anything up in the helicopter of what the banter is on deck or screaming or shouting, but I suddenly realized and said to the pilot, this is going to be a nice sequence here because the boat on the right, Svea, uh, actually Valshida, sorry, JK7, is going to try and make the starting line, but she will not get in there uh, because Ranger has got the pole position. So I'm just going to take you through a little sequence. You can see Valshida on the left, it's 
Um, now it's, it's a moment here. What do we do? Do we do a circle or do we bear away? Is there still enough room to bear away and not catch Ranger Stern? And they're like, and I said to the pilot, you know, I said, this guy's going to go for it. He is not going to take no for an answer. So uh, you can see this is leading to a bit of a disaster situation. And she gave the committee boat transom a hell of a bang, you know, took the whole teak rail off the back of the boat, off the back of that. I think it's a, you know, it's a Grand Banks or whatever. But of course, you know, she was then at that point well behind. But the rest of the fleet carried on regardless. And here's Ranger, the mighty Ranger. A fortunate day for me as I had the helicopter and as the boats sailed north with a southerly, southwesterly breeze, um, you know, there's two, four, five, and where's the sixth boat? Well, Kenny, way ahead, out of frame on the right-hand side on Hanuman, uh, was just absolutely cranking, had good speed. But just the sums up Narragansett Bay and looking at Jamestown and the mooring field of Jamestown and the harbor and of course the bridge. So a sequence of how to spend $190,000. You can see on the right hand side, the foot of the jib is starting to show some strain and the boat bow goes down and a whole load of water goes into the foot of the jib. And I was like, I wonder if this is gonna survive. Well, of course, you can see the rip appearing on the right-hand side and this went from bad to worse to just sort of from the foot all the way to the head, the sail split all the way completely. So lots of banging and screaming and as the guys were trying to get another head sole up. But um, yeah, expensive game, sailing big boats. Anna, do you ever use a drone to take any of the aerial photos? I've used yeah, I have used drones before. I've had several drones. At the moment, I don't have one. I'll probably get another one again. Um, but the FAA is really clamping down that you have to become certified and that you can't fly near airports. And really, if you look at it theoretically and according to the rules, we're not allowed to fly uh, anywhere sort of on Narragansett Bay because we're so close to Quonset. But, you know, you've got to fly below the radar and do it all on the QT. But it's a wonderful shoot with. I, I always think it's better for video than for stills. And really, at the end of the day, when somebody says we need aerials, I'll say, let's grab a helicopter. You just have much better control, better perspective with longer lenses. And you can see exactly what you're doing. And it's totally legal. So, um, good question there. Here's Massif. The name of the boat it's a french insurance company sailed by 36 year old francois gabald and here he was finishing the baker lee the single-handed transatlantic race in eight days so here's a man you know he's a fairly slightly built guy sailing a hundred hundred footer with a 115 foot mast across the atlantic in the race pretty pretty cool look at the way that they are now they're almost in like a cockpit or a cocoon where they get out of the weather and these boats are just hammering along at sort of 20, 25, 30 knots constantly. So you can imagine there's a lot of cold breeze, a lot of spray, and to get out of that for these guys is just so much better, uh, more protection. But from my point of view, it's hard to shoot because you don't see the people. It's almost like an automated machine. Uh, this boat has a beam of, 69. These guys spend 90% of the time on the autopilot. So again, here, of course, the boat's on autopilot and he is trimming the main. Uh, you know, I was sort of trying to get the chase boat in the right place to make sure that we could see him uh, giving a grind. So he's tucked away in his cocoon. So I was very curious why they wouldn't make these boats fully foiling and did a bunch of reading about it. And they said, for a single-handed guy on a hundred foot, you know, out of control, the guy would not be able to control the boat. It would just be too fast and too much for him. I'm sure that'll change, but that's the ruling, not the ruling, but that's the opinion nowadays, you know, why we don't see these mass of things out of the water. So this was where the finishing line was. And of course, the lower end of New York and Manhattan. And that's sort of a, I'm sure today, that's a pretty different scene to what we saw here but a, a beautiful place and a beautiful time of day to shoot the finish. And here's our happy Frenchman, you know, cheering with the champagne. 
mm -hmm. orders of the press here had flown in from Paris and he was on the plane the next morning to be on television in France live. These guys are the heroes in Europe. You know, it's unbelievable. It's so popular. There. This was in Brooklyn, in a, uh, a marina in Brooklyn. The first monohull was Hugo Boss, sailed by Alex Thompson. And this is an Imoca 60. And uh, this is also in the Bakerly single-handed transatlantic race. Coming um, under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, coming up towards New York. So this is looking over Ellis Island from a helicopter. And uh, the boat Vivid had hired me to fly down there. It was a European owner. And he wanted to show um, his mates that he was sailing in the United States. How American is this? So a wonderful spot to photograph. And I was obviously on the radio positioning the boat and then talking to the pilot, getting the right perspective. Probably ended up shooting this with about a 200 millimeter lens just to get the, the right perspective. Still in New York, uh, in the harbor on the, on the Hudson River. And this is the fleet of AC-45s in the World Series. Just wonderful shootings. And, you know, we had good chase boats down there. Once you got accreditation, you had two or three photographers and a super good driver. It was tough going for these guys down there. A lot of current, shifty breeze as it comes through the buildings. But um, I was pretty happy. I loved it there. Ben Ainsley with Land Rover cooking along just at the bottom of uh, New York in the other business district. Battery Park as the Kiwis come off a foil and they just dug one, a deep one. It's like, goodness, I don't know, but wonderful to watch. Look at all the people. It was just wonderful to see so many people watching sailing. So this was a, a, a wonderful project that I was involved with for 10 years, uh, a boat called Shaman. And this is a Bill Trip 88 foot design boat, a carbon boat with water ballast. And the owner um, wanted me to document the boat's travels around the world. And I worked with Rob for, like I said, 10 years and probably joined them once or twice a year for anywhere from two. And this was, the, the, was Bear Glacier in the Kenai Fjord in Alaska. This is shooting a new tartan on Lake Erie, just north of Cleveland. Uh, a tartan, probably about a 34, something like that. And then the Sunfish Worlds in Charleston. Good lineup, nice colors, 100 boats. And with the Cooper River Bridge in the background, this was uh, in 2006. And then it's off to Rake. Lake Ray Hubbard in Texas for the VXs. And this was early days for the VX fleet because this was their first, I think, I think it was regatta and they had 20 boats and they were pretty psyched. So obviously they've grown a hell of a lot since then. And my mate Brian Bennett, who designed the boat, said to me, would you come and shoot? And we had a blast down there. But these guys know about trophies. This must be the best sailing trophy I have seen. So. Um, Obviously, so Texan. Ice boating on Watapa Pond in Fall River in Massachusetts. You know, what else do you do in February and March when it's solid ice out? And I was to get the emails from these guys, and they said, Well, Watapa Pond is wonderful. And I spent a few hours there, all decked out and dressed up, and wonderful place to photograph. So on a that picture, you don't have any chase boat. <laughs> yeah, I ended up taking a 200 to 400 millimeter lens with me, which has a converter on it, and I can click that into 560. So I'm fairly flexible in that I could stand in one spot and really pan as these guys were crossing tacks. But um, yeah, it's, it's a whole different thing to photograph. These guys are nuts. They're, they go fast. They get up to about 50, 55 miles an hour. You know. Key West race week and the, the Swan class 45s. And I don't know, I must have done 15 key, at least 15 Key West race weeks. 
and it was always you know when you're planning the event to go and shoot it in sort of October to make the hotel bookings you're like ah why should I go again and whatever but then when it's time to go in January I was like psyched ready to jump on the plane and go and enjoy the beautiful water of Key West and you know Duval Street with all its crazy bars and places like that. So were you in the water to take this picture? Uh, this was chase boat with a long lens probably 400 500 millimeter and really focusing on the boats in the foreground and not focusing on the water in the foreground. So you get this nice blown out sort of watery look. And if the water color there is fabulous. And the harder it blows out of the east, the milkier it gets. So, uh, you know, for me, the northerly there was boring because it was flat water, but easterly made it all happen. So this was my rig. Um, I stayed in a little B&B somewhere on Duval and it was just too far to walk. And I thought, well, I'll take my plastic pelican box or my uh, whatever um, and, and I made this rig at home and then obviously I, I traveled on the plane with this and then when you look what's inside the box is all my gear and that way I can keep my gear dry when I'm on the chase boat and then open up and it's just ready to go so I've got four camera bodies and on the right hand side is a 500 millimeter then a 300 in the middle then on the left hand side the white one is a 70 to 200 and then I also have 24 to 70. So four camera bodies and four lenses, no need to change anything. You can just pick it up and shoot. And if you want to change perspective or whatever, grab the other one, because that's really the kiss of death when you've got to start changing lenses out there and it's wet and damp. That's really when the damage happens. If the, if the cameras are closed up with the lenses connected, there's no problem at all. So that's the only way I feel is to get three or four bodies. I mean, it's obviously an expensive, way to do it but it works. Hep Fouts Bellamente on the right hand side and I start for these the black boats wait to lure it. Wonderful class to photograph. I did a lot of work for Hap over the years with Bellamente and with Whisper and talking to them about doing some of the America's Cup work now because he's one of the obviously syndicate head for uh, the American syndicate. Jet Al with a takedown. So here we can see it's Quantum Key West Race Week in 2016. Wonderful stuff. I'd always charter a local fisherman down there and get a, it was about a 28 foot open fishing boat and, you know, go. He, he was an, a retired sailor and now a, a guy and a Mo. He, what a wonderful man to work with. He always knew how to put me in the right place. Dan Myers' number is a 66 foot yodel frolic design off Miami in the Acura race week. Nice and lumpy and bumpy. And again, for these guys, it's wet and gnarly. And for us, it's just smooth sailing. Talking to the pilot, try and hover in the right place and get the action as the bow goes up and crashes down. And then it's off to Lake Pontchartrain in southern, the Southern Yacht Club in New Orleans. And this is high school kids the Great Oaks Invitational event. And I was asked, one of my boy who was on the right hand side with a little beanie on, um, one of the teachers said, would you come and give us a hand down there? We just need one more parent to sort of help, you know, with the kids. And I said, yeah, I'll bring a camera along. So we, we had a blast, very windy, muddy, shallow water, um, but nice, I've got a spot on the, on the committee boat. So I was happy there, but out of the corner of my eye, I noticed these guys seemed like they were going downhill in a big way. I didn't quite figure out what was happening. But um, normally I thought, well, it, the rudder needs to be in the water. I don't know why it's out of the water, but it just went from the, <laughs> at some point, this guy had to slide off and the rest is history. This is hull number one of the Sparkman Stevens design Morris number, Morris 29 on Biscayne Bay. And this is also the cover of my new book called Sailing America. And, um, you know, very patriotic with a flag and beautiful late light. Again, as we were saying earlier, why do you shoot early and late? This is late and this is why you do it because you get these beautiful soft tones. And, you know, we were on Biscayne Bay and there was a little bit of an humidity in the air. And that really 
works. I don't like it when it's crisp and clear because then it's too contrasty. You get a little bit of haze. You know what we get here in Narragansett Bay in the afternoons is a smoky sou'wester. Well, at two o'clock, it's ugly. But at five and six o'clock, when that breeze dies down a little, it's beautiful, soft light. Same as, as, as in this shot. And here I was trying a little something different. So I put the camera in a waterproof housing and leant over the front of the dinghy of the tender and shot very, very low. The camera is literally touching the water, but waterproof housing. So it didn't matter if I got a little lower. And here you can see I was absolutely in the water, running along, you know, with the camera over the side and sort of shooting, looking up at, Kyler and their guys sailing the, the new 29. Back in the air shooting the, the star fleet of, at the Bacardi Cup on Biscayne Bay. They built over 2,000 of these boats and there's 170 fleets worldwide. And to me, this is just beautiful. I mean, obviously they're white boats and white sails, but it's like sculpture. Nice start. Ukrainian boats. And then downwind, it's rock and roll for these guys where they have one guy standing at the mast and they let that back stay off. And you think that it looks like the tip of the mast is over the front of the boat or even further forward. Again, Key Biscayne. The boat was designed in 1910 and the first ones were built in that winter of 1910, 1911 in Port Washington. And uh, the designer's name is Francis Swigert. He also designed the Barnegie Bay B-class cat boat. Talk about extreme differences. On a Tracy, yeah. oh, sorry, I keep reading them wrong. Tacy uh, Taligo um, is wondering if you use different body types with each lens. I try not to. I try and use the same body because then it's just so easy to go from one to the other. Obviously, if I'm in the middle style and something new coming out, but that, that box shot that I showed you earlier, those were all 5D Mark III's. And then I went over to 5D Mark IV, and now I'm going to the R, to the mirrorless R, where I have two of those and still one 5D Mark III. But it's, it's better to have the same. It's just a better, the same feel and the settings. And yeah, so that's, I think, I hope that answers your question. Uh, on Jay, the way to Anagata, yes. Sorry, <laughs> another no question, problem. and then we'll get back to it. Jay Wilson is referring back to the shot of Lower Manhattan and is wondering if there's any tips about shooting stationary buildings on land from a moving boat. So I, you just uh, faded away there for a minute. So do, do I have any tips for shooting buildings from a moving boat? Is that correct? It? Yeah, so I've shot in the Hudson River many a time uh, in all different conditions. And, um, I, you know, I've, I would say most of the time I've used fairly wide lenses because it's so nice to get the top of the buildings when the, the World Trade Centers were still up and now with the, the Liberty Tower and that. It's, it's, it's really a mix of, you know, if I'm shooting, I was just down there recently doing a, a Grand Bay and fairly far away with a long lens and then I get close with a wide angle lens and I shot late in the day sort of 5 36 o'clock on the Hudson River and then uh, you know looking looking east so I had the, the buildings all lit up beautifully but you know, it's sort of all over the place really so these are my kids the previous shot was my boy on a charter catamaran we did a lot of work for the moorings over years and these are my older two uh, doing a little photo modeling for the old man in the USVI, would be a bad place to be right now. My yes. Shots. Which one? The previous one. The one of your kids diving off the. Ah, boat. thank you. Yeah, they've, you know, they've been modeling for me since day one, and um, I must say the best one was Reed, our daughter, the oldest gal, who she would do it six, five, six, seven times the same thing where the boys once or twice and I'd say do it again ah no they'd swim away or they'd walk away well Reed always ended up getting on the cover or on the spread of the magazine because she just worked with me on it um so now it was time to go out so what I've really shown you is a lot of the stock that we had and now we go out and shoot for the book and really fill up in the archive that we needed to make it sort of a rounded collection of um you know book images as 
of the United States. And Tenley said, well, where do you want to go first? Tenley's my wife, and she ended up doing all the logistics and the planning and was very involved in editing the images in the book. And, and I said, I'd love to go and do the Class A scals in Minnesota on Lake Minnetonka. And Tenley's from there. So, of course, that wasn't very hard to organize. And so we were guests in this house. And then, as you can see, under the, uh, the tent or the tarp, there was that was my chase boat and uh, we were set up it was a wonderful event um, the, again same a class scales on Lake Minnetonka and this is sort of what I'd envisioned this kind of picture two boats together shy reaching big kites up but I was blown away at just the way these guys sail these boats the guys and the gals sail the boats um, beautiful sails beautifully trimmed um, a lot of sail from not that many people Elizabeth Gow has a shout out to Tenley. Uh, right, to Tenley, when I see her, she's, um, by the sound of things, busy in the kitchen. <laughs> um, so flounder lives, and what about shrimping? You know, when a kite goes in the water and people laugh, and yeah, they spend 10 minutes shrimping. Well, I guess these guys were floundering, literally and figuratively. A blunt bow makes for a nice picture when it punches into the wave like that. I don't know how much water goes actually into the boat, but it looks like a lot. And of course they do capsize day on the lake. And I was like, whoa, these guys look a little jammed and crazy, but never fear, fun and games, as these guys are waiting for the tow and to turn the boat back right side up. And what do you do with an old scow? When it's, when it's done and it's not worth fixing anymore, they cut a hole in the bottom of the cockpit and they make a bar out of it. It was just an amazing scene to be with these people in Minnesota and hear about their sailing stories and photograph their, their event. The next list, the next location is the log canoes in, in the Chesapeake Bay. And I'd only seen pictures of a mate of mine, Bob Greiser, a very good shooter. Um, spent a lot of time photographing these boats. So when Tenley said, right, where, what's next after Minnesota? I said, the log canoes. So they, they were originally sort of started racing in the, in the late 1800s. There are still 24 boats left. And it's kind of interesting. They build them with three to nine log, logs longitudinally. And you can see, look how long the spar is. I mean, that's got to be sort of upwards of 80 feet, that spar. So here we are. This was a two-day event in St. Michael's on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. And um, fairly light air, but already they got two guys on the, the plank. And I love the design of that little windsurfer for sale. And later on at the bar, I said to the guy, Oh, where did you find that windsurfer for sale from days gone by? He says, oh, no, that was a custom design, and we spent a lot of time getting that right and how to sheet it to the mizzen and so on. I was like, whoops, sorry, said the wrong thing there, but these boats are amazing. This lady's got the, the best seat in them, and um, you'd think that she actually drives the bus and is in command, and probably is, uh, but she's not driving because obviously way in front of her is the, the rudder and the tiller. Just some nice crossing tacks. And it's just not a matter of ducking and diving. You know, with these boats, you got, if you bear away, you just power up so much that things can go wrong pretty quickly. But this is right on the edge where they've got every man they can, you know, muster out on the rail for ballast. And the little guy in the cap, youngest, lightest little guy is bailing. Keep the boat dry. Obviously, when you tack these boats, you've got to get your timing right. Well, these guys didn't only get the timing wrong, but one of the boards broke as well. So then there's a lot of swimming going on. And we saw several boats literally, you know, either not getting the timing right on a tack or a board breaking or crew members falling over the side. And I was amazed that nobody was wearing life jackets. So I guess they got their own reason for that. Anna, when you shoot individuals, do you have to get releases in order to release the photos? That's coming from Carl Abramson. Yeah, so he, so you're breaking up a little bit, so sometimes okay. I don't get your whole question. 
But um, were you saying, do I get releases from the people that are actually in the pictures? Yes. Uh, I do not. Uh, sometimes if I know that a particular shot's gonna be used for advertising, I will. Um, but for editorial, so for a book or a calendar or a magazine, uh, you do not need model releases or property releases. If, let's say, Coca-Cola came to me and said, we want to use this for a national ad campaign, believe me, I would drive down to St. Michael's and I would find every single person. But there is ways of doing it, but it's, it's pretty difficult. So really, to answer your question, I don't get them for when it's book projects and so on. And this was a bad tack, bad timing, you know, and of course, a little more swimming. 18 crew. And of that, we have 16 on the board, 15 on the boards. See this breeze there? This 16, 16 knots. And then we headed off to California and we started off in Southern California and I really didn't have enough. I had San Francisco and a couple of other areas in the archive, but I just thought, let's start off in Southern California and see how many little yacht clubs and cruising spots and mooring fields we can hit on the way. Uh, so here's San Diego and the guided missile destroyer, Paul Jones, at 500 feet, Warsaw, Cal 37. John Paul Jones. My fearless leader, Tenley, stick in hand. And this was uh, earlier, Tenley was very involved in doing the logistics of all the travel that we did, I would sort of say where we would go, and then Tenley would do the logistics on air travel, car rental, hotels, and all that kind of stuff. And it was almost always little crazy little Airbnbs and wonderful places to stay. And the stick in hand was if I didn't behave and I wasn't shooting right, I get a whack on the, on the head with a stick. So this was in Southern California. And then shooting the Santa Barbara Youth Sailing Federation, the 420s, sailing here off Santa Barbara. And a place to sail. Nice weather. Should be soon. I think we were down here in April, May, and New England was still pretty cold and raw. These are a pair of harbor seals on Point Castillo at Santa Barbara. I'd heard a lot about Catalina, and we ended up taking the ferry out there from Long Beach. Uh, and spent the night here and walked around and hiked and photographed and late light here. Um, Avalon is the name of the, we are about 22 miles to the southwest of LA. We ended up chartering or renting a small little, seemed like a 14 foot little powerboat, just to putz around a bit and see if we could see any locals sailing around. So the, the island's 22 miles long and eight miles wide. And this is also Catalina. We were driving a little further north and we we're on route 1A or 1 PCH. Every now and again between the buildings you could see the water and suddenly at a traffic light I stopped and looked left and I saw a bunch of boats racing. I said bingo, take a hard left here, headed towards the water and from the beach I shot these, um, the match racing near Long Beach on the Huntington Pier and also the Congressional Cup location, and it's been a famous event and location for this type of sailing for years. It was just nice to see how they cater to the people there who can do some fishing while the others sail. Moro Bay, Central California coast, about halfway between Monterey and Santa Barbara. Again, spent a night here, uh, a couple nights shooting early morning, and the fog would lift, and you know, it's sort of a lot of times I just take off on my own early in the morning camera bag over my shoulder and just after, after sunset and work for a couple of hours and then meet Tenley for breakfast and then would normally just pack up and head up onto the next location. So this is Moro Bay. And this is actual Moro Rock. And you can see the channel that goes just in front of the rock from, from the ocean or leave the lagoon and head out to sea. But this is uh, like the Rock of Gibraltar of the Pacific. So this was taken up fairly high up uh, on the golf course. And then we headed off to Silt's, the Stillwater Yacht Club 
which is uh, not far from Pebble Beach and uh, just south of Monterey. And these are three Santana 22s. A little bit of a lumpy day there. Pacific swell rolling in. I'm an avid swimmer and work in the ocean. And this was one very tempting place just to slide in and go for a swim. But obviously being a private yacht club, that was totally taboo. You can see the Pebble Beach Yacht Club in the background. The Yacht Club and of course the, I meant the Pebble Beach Golf Club, sorry. Brainwashed by Yacht Clubs. Monterey Yacht Club and their beer can series. Again, fortunate in that the timing was right. I think this was a Thursday night and a nice breeze, nice light and just a wonderful group of people. They organized a chase boat for me and it was all, all set. And out of nowhere, this Shields pops a South African, you know, spinnaker. And I was like, wonderful. That's the South African flag. And later on at the, at the yacht club where we had dinner with these people, it was just nice catching up and hearing some Cape Town tales of these guys that live in, in Monterey. You know, we're spoiled here, and, but um, they had a few Shields here as well. I was kind of surprised. Anna. Yeah. Patricia Johnson is asking if there are any Shields photos in the new book. This particular photograph is in the book and there may be one other, but I know this one is for sure in the book and this is a Shields. I was always wondering why they had such big steel mooring balls in California. Well, you've got to be dogs, you know. So obviously, uh, harbor seals. Heading north, and this is the Pigeon Point Light, built in 1871, and lies between Santa Cruz and San, San Francisco. And this is the, the tallest lighthouse in California. It was nice being on our own schedule and our own time, and just the two of us, and the mission was photography. So anytime that I saw something nice, we could just turn off, have a look, is it worth shooting? Is it worth walk, walking further along? Um, and we sort of had a fairly loose time schedule that if I said, well, I want to stick around and catch some late light here, we could. You know, it was kind of it was a wonderful way to see that whole West Coast, not the whole West Coast, but, you know, we went from San Diego to sort of Marin County and San Francisco area. Talking about San Francisco, you know, you... Whenever I shoot this, it was always the America's Cup or so the, the, some Trans-Pacific race starting or finishing or, you know, the big boat series. But here was a single solar training and under the Golden Gate Bridge with the Marin County Hills in the background. And the St. Francis Yacht Club Committee boat uh, getting ready to set a line and get these, I think, J... Who knows, 22s, J80s, and tons of traffic. I mean, container ships and, you know, tankers. And this was taken from the, the, the deck or the upper deck at the St. Francis Yacht Club. This is Point Bonita Lighthouse uh, in Marin Headland. From um, the Marin Headland, uh, looking sort of in a northwestly direction. And then if you turn around and look the other way, then you're looking at the St. Francis Yacht Club smack bang in the middle with a red roof. And then of course, with the Golden Gate Bridge in the foreground and a couple of sailing boats. Wonderful place to photograph on the bay, the bay area. It's always cold, you gotta wear foul weather gear and it sort of reminds me of boating in Cape Town where the water's cold, it's probably 50 degree water and the air is probably 65, but so. And then it's off to Tumales Bay which is uh, you head over the Golden Gate Bridge and go towards Inverness and Point Reyes National Seashore. And this is Tamales Bay. Late light, again, late in the afternoon, shooting straight into the setting sun. Glacier National Park was time to, this was a different trip and it was time to head in to, towards Montana because we had found a couple of boats there. And uh, I thought, well, while we're there, why don't we just go and do Glacier National Park at the same time? What an amazing place. 
this was at the North Flathead Lake Yacht Club. And I watched these guys packing this, putting this hunter sailboat away. And I thought that lady in that plastic chair has got the right idea. And she was just chatting to the boys and saying, ah, oh, you got the sail tie in the right place and don't forget the halyard. And it's like, mom's commanding here. This is wonderful. So I'd never used a pontoon boat as a chase boat. You know, we don't see these things on the ocean. And uh, so here we were on Flathead Lake and we said, what are we going to charter? Well, we charter one of these. So Tenley drove and I had a wonderful, I had a couch to shoot from. Can you imagine? And this was great. So here was our scene, a Q class. These are 50 foot Harrishoff designed boats on Flathead Lake in Montana. And who would think that you'd find a, a 50 footer designed by Harrishoff, built by Harrishoff on a lake in Montana. And we spent you know, from sort of three o'clock till five o'clock waiting for the light to come out and it was overcast and the, the skipper called me on the radio and he said, another 20 minutes and we got to head back in, you know, and I was like, I need to do a little prayer, say a little prayer here, a blue hole appeared and the light cranked and we got some beautiful light. You can see it's pretty dramatic, you know. I mean, it would have been easy to have said, ah, I'm not going to go, forget it, it's too cloudy. It's worth going out there. Yeah, in the worst case, you get nothing, but when it comes out and you just hit the jackpot, you got a winner. So these are all the cue boats, two of them up there. Look at the beautiful detail, the original old bronze mast fittings. And then we were off to the Great Lakes and Mac. So this is a, a 333 mile race that starts on Lake Michigan and finishes on Lake Huron in Mackinac. And uh, I got a spot on one of the press boats just to shoot WindQuest uh, finishing. And again, same thing we went out, it was overcast and pretty dismal and gray. And I was like, well, let's just go. What else have we got to do? And just about 15 or 10 minutes before sunset, the sun popped out and it was just magic. So, Anna, there's a question here from Daniel Cole. Great show. Thanks. You make it look so effortless. Can you comment <laughs> on how much time you spend in post-production? Somebody else wanted to know, hey, how much Photoshop do you do? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge believer in shooting it right when you're on the water. And when you get back to the computer, you make just... I tell you the biggest change or biggest adjustment I do on almost every picture is straighten the horizon. But other than that, I do a little tweak here and there in Lightroom. I do not believe in doing big tweaks and then it becomes fake and false. Um, so all these shots that you see and that are in this book are all minimally sort of optimized. I always say, I take a really good capture or a good digital file and I make a good shot perfect in the computer with just a few little tweaks here and there. And, you know, I have people, clients who will say to me, you know, we've got to get this boat out. We've got to shoot this ad off this boat and the boat leaves on the truck for Florida tomorrow and today it's overcast. You can do your magic in Photoshop. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. You know, you've got to have nice light and that's what you've got to start with. And this was WindQuest actually crossing the finishing line again, right at sunset. I mean, look at the lovely red color of the sun and the luff of the, the head sole and also the bottom paint was just lit up by this peachy color. And then it was off to the Pacific Northwest, the Seattle areas and the totem poles. And uh, this was, we took one of the ferries that goes around there and look a thousand feet from the, one of the, the higher mountains in Washington state. What a wonderful place to sail and cruise. For Townsend in Washington, what to me seems like the wooden boat sort of capital of the Northwest, unlike, just very similar, not unlike Maine, you know, sort of the, the whole wooden boat scene we have in, in Maine, these guys have there in, in Port Washington, in Port Townsend, sorry. And then we were headed off to the 
Columbia Gorge and timed that with the Malgus 24s. They had a regatta going on there. It wasn't honking as strongly as I'd heard. I mean, we probably had about 16, 17, 18 knots of wind. Um, but what made it interesting was, yeah, maybe there's a little more, maybe it's 18, whatever, 19, but these kite borders, unbelievable. They were all over the place. And I had a hard time concentrating on the Malgus and not shooting these kite borders. But of course, you know, a start. You know, yeah, right, but this guy was cranking along right in the middle, getting a little air, one handed a ball. Crazy. So, so Anna, I have another question. Someone is, is looking for the reference to your uh, second wind video that PBS put out. And so the video is second wind. And if you <sighs> Google second wind and Anna Vanderwall, you'll find uh, the uh, Vimeo uh, video. Yes, correct. Is he I also just shared it in the chat, the link. Else? No, he just wanted to know the name of it. Yeah, second wind, exactly. Yep. Next destination was Hawaii. I'd sailed to Hawaii several times and raced there and photographed there, but I really didn't get a lot of nice imagery and I thought it was time to jump on the planes with the beautiful ladies on the tail and head out to Honolulu. Of course, the first thing we had to do was shoot a little bit of boogie boarding, body surfing and surfing. And this is just a short south coast because we were there in the summer. So there's not much happening on the north shore, but this is all south, south shore. And some of the outriggers at first light in the morning, we found a little hotel very close to this spot. And it's like, man, look at the colors and just wonderful outriggers. Some of them sailing and some of them rowing, but all traditionally rigged. So these are Polynesian outriggers. Then we went off to Maui, and this was on the North Shore, again, kiteboarding. And you see it all over the place, very popular. So then we ended up going to Hanalei Bay in Kauai and the Nepali coast. And I'd sort of done some research and I had sailed here once before because I did the Transpac race in 83, sailed to Honolulu. And there, from there, we cruised this area. And I so remember it and I said to Tenley, we've got to come back here and photograph for the book. Um, and so, but I wanted to find a sailboat that could sail in front of the Nepal. Um, it's an amazing area and that's more to the right. Uh, and you'd have to go sort of around the corner and sail in that area. But this is Hanalei Bay. So I ended up chartering a helicopter and getting, this is a, a great story, you know, I didn't know how to find somebody to sail a boat for me in front of these dramatic cliffs because the boats just don't sail there. So I ended up on Facebook, I put a little ping out there and said, help, um, anybody have any contacts in Hawaii? and no boat uh, on Kauai and especially to do the Nepali coast. Well, this woman knew, this, this woman, you know, got back to me from uh, Honolulu and said, I know somebody that has a boat, in a case, long story short, he said, love to do it. I said, I'll make sure you get a signed copy of the book and a nice big print of your boat in front of the cliffs. And this is what we ended up with. It was a little on the edge because we flew over the cliffs in the rain and I was like, ah, we've come all this way, you know? And um, now we've got rain, but just in between the rain shower, there was a little man down below. I was in radio contact with him and say, yeah, okay, a little on starboard tech, dry brown, go back again. We ended up getting the shot. And this is a, a double page spread in the book. And he was kind enough to, you know, once we flew back to the South shore uh, of Kauai, jumped in the car, spent the night. The next day we joined him and his girlfriend for a wonderful sail. Uh, you know, off the Nepali coast, and it's so dramatic. We go from one extreme to the other. I really wanted to catch the the college sailings, and these are the uh, obviously the John Hancock Building and Back Bay in the background. And uh, this was an event put on by Northeastern, and this is the Oberg Regatta on the Charles. FJs, hard on the wind, and nice 
full color. And again, they organized a nice chase boat for me and I could putch through the fleet. And if I wanted to take a break, I just ended up standing on the roof of the MIT boathouse with a 500 millimeter lens and got some very nice perspective. Looking over uh, again, still on the chart, uh, Courageous Sailing Center and the Business District of Boston. You know, it's not every day that I get the thumbs up from sailors. I sometimes get reasonably close and I feel I'm pretty clean and in a good spot and I don't always get the thumb waved at me. It's sometimes other fingers on the guy's hand, but these guys are pretty happy and uh, wonderful stuff. But you know, when the puff comes through, it's very fluky there where the breeze comes through the buildings and of course, bang, bang, four or five boats are over in a heartbeat. And the struggle to get the boat back These are fireflies and 420s on the dock in front of the boathouse on the Charles. This is the MIT boathouse. Just a couple pictures of my 2015, 2016 restoration of Snook. And I, I thought I just wanted to show these in my show because we used the boat a lot to get uh, the, the, the Southern New England, you know, pictures of Stonington and Block Island and the Elizabeth Islands. And so this was a little story of how many 236 for Pearson. And as we were talking earlier about Rhode Island PBS uh, produced a beautiful 60 minute uh, documentary about how I did all the work and sort of yours truly painting the bilges. And this is her when she was done. Uh, so she's 36 feet, built in 1972, and the name Snook, as I described earlier, you can see it looks like a barracuda, but it's a South African delicacy. My youngest boy, Adrian, driving on the leeward side. Making... Anna, sure there's, oh, sorry, you froze for a second. Can you hear me? Yes, I got you. There are a few um, other questions. One was, do you have a favorite place to shoot and do you have a favorite lens or a go-to lens? Okay, two very difficult questions. <laughs> um, good questions, but very hard to answer. Because, you know, if I'm talking about a favorite place to shoot in the winter, I, 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 I love the Bahamas. I've done a lot of travel all over the Bahamas and I really... I'm going to go back. Uh, maybe we'll take Snook down there or something else. So that's one of my summertime. That's easy because it's Narragansett Bay. I mean, I travel all over the world for my work, and there is no better place than from June until October to be on Narragansett Bay, either swimming or fishing or shooting or sailing. So I hope that answers your question. My favorite lens? Tough to say. I mean, on the long end, I use a 200 to 400 millimeter lens with a 1.4 converter on it, uh, which is fairly long because then it gives me a range of 200 to 560. And then I would say my next favorite lens is probably a 70 to 200. So I hope that helps. But questions, absolutely email me or give me a shout and I'd love to help you. We have, we have a question about polarizing filters. Yes. So... The pictures that I took of the guy um, in Maui when he was on the kite board, that was with a polarizer. I don't use them a lot. I really only use them in the tropics if I have to shoot in the middle of the day. And that really accentuates the white clouds and the beautiful blue water. And it cuts the, I'd say in the islands, down in the Caribbean islands, I use it a lot. But up in New England, I'd rather wait for the beautiful late light and then go without. So don't, I see some people doing my workshops, they come with a polarizer glued on the lens. I said, the first thing you do is take that off and use it very sparingly. There is a place and a time for it. I'm going to give you a little, just talk a little bit about the actual physical book. So this is the book that we did. Um, it's a 12 inch and once obviously you open it up it's 24 inches oops sorry skipped a uh, 24 inch spread and then i was very fortunate that gary jobson agreed to do the introduction so um, a lot of lies and i sort of wonder if it was even me he was talking about but gary writes a beautiful piece thank you gary 
I split the book up, and that's always a challenge when you do a book, is how do you split it up? You can't just throw a bunch of pretty pictures into a book. You've got to sort of get some chapters going. So we decided to take U.S. sailings, how they split the country or the United States up. And as is, uh, you know, pretty much New England, and that's in white. And so this is how it goes through the whole book, A, B, C, D, E. So that's how we decided to do it. The book was very simply laid out with very nice designs and every page is different. So here we have three images on one page and then a larger on the left. And then you look at this particular spread, two almost equally sized images, but they both work very nicely in a vertical. And then we go to a spread. And of course this is Comanche and there's a lot of double page spreads and they just work so nicely with a horizontal format picture. And then we have a bunch of these four foot, four page gatefolds. So this is literally four feet or 48 inches of just, you know, paper and ink and sailboat pictures. So they, they, they you know, Rizzoli did a great job in designing it and laying it out and Tenley ended up, the way that the workflow went was we'd go out and shoot. I'd come back to, to you know, our gallery where I have my office on Bannister's Wharf. And there I would edit my pictures, put them on a, our San Francisco is done and then she would pick the selects and ship them off to the editor and discuss what was to be used and then they'd come back to me for the caption and the color corrections and this is how we did the index so obviously every page is numbered and this way you can see exactly the name of the boat the place the location and for those of you that are shutterbugs and like to know what camera I used or my settings or my lenses it's all there every single photograph is is nicely captioned and I'm we love to I love to sign so if you have me personalize a book to you to your mother to your brother whatever I can write whatever you like and a little scribble with my signature so this is where I'm going to end my show you say where can you get the book just go onto the website or you can give us a shout uh, we're we're busy with you know internet sales thank goodness we have that uh, the gallery will open i think in about a week and a half but give me a shout i'd love to sell you a book you've got the whole story about it here and i hope you enjoyed it thanks for watching anna if you don't mind we have about two unanswered questions that were asked during the chat um sorry the talk um one is from scott cluett and he states, hi, I've been lucky to attend a few of your workshops. Amazing experiences. You shot my wife and I jump off a dock in Newport Harbor many years ago for our taking the plunge announcement. How often yes. do you get requests for non-nautical photography and do you enjoy it? I, I really don't get a lot of call for non-marine <clears throat> photography. I mean, I, I will sort of... I get shipping photography requests, I get lighthouses, little, little harbor, all related to the water, the ocean, the sea, maritime. And that's sort of what people know me for. And that's what I have on my website and, um, and that works. So I really don't dive into anything else unless it's sort of part of a show or, or something like that. And then the other question was, do you miss film since you changed over to digital prints? That's a, that's a very good question. And, you know, people are a lot cheaper now. Um, the cameras in the days of film, a very good film camera was $1,400. And now the cameras that I use, if you use a, a good Canon, they're about six and a half thousand dollars Then you've got to get yourself a really good computer and a hard drive system and a laptop to take on the road so the initial setup is very very expensive um, it's also very labor intensive because not only do you go out and shoot but you've got to catalog everything correctly and then you know tweak them and make them right but it's great that you do have final output whereas with slides you'd scan it and if it was dark end of story whereas with digital files, you have some leeway of taking a dark file and making it a little brighter. And the other huge advantage is, and you know, what would happen to me in the days of slides is 
somebody would call up, be it an ad agency or a magazine, and they'd say, oh, we need 20 pictures for an ad campaign. So you pick your best 20 shots from some a theme, FedEx it down there, and this happens several times you call a guy up and you say, where are the pictures? What's going on? Are you using it? He says, oh, I can't find them. And so people would lose a sleeve of like 20 or 30 photographs. And these were really mass, no, I can't say that, but they, they were really good pictures and it would just broke my heart that they would be gone. That doesn't happen anymore with digital because you send somebody, you know, a disc or a thumb drive or you email them. And if somebody says, oh, I can't find them, well, that's not a problem, you just send them again. So, and, and if it's somebody that you don't quite know and you're concerned they're gonna use the, maybe use it unauthorized, you send a very small thumbnail with a watermark in it. So the thing that I miss about slides is how easy it was to put them on the light table, put them in a sleeve and use them. But I, I do love the color we have today with digital. Digital is so much better. The file is much, much nicer. Sorry, a long-winded answer for a short question. So, Anna, Anna, we have an endless stream of thank yous, bravos. I mean, it seems like you've got a virtual standing ovation. So <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, wonderful. I wish I could hear it and see it. This is that we're talking to a computer in my living room and knowing there must be well over 300 people watching, which is wonderful. And thank you so much all for coming and listening and seeing my pictures and hopefully we can sell you a book. Don't be shy. We still have a few left, but um, thanks again for everybody. And if there are any more questions, I'll, I'm happy to hang around or if you guys want to pull the plug and be done with it, we can do that too. Anna, you will be able to see the chat and I can also save that. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to Amanda just to do a little closing for those that do want to log off. Got it. Wonderful. Thanks, Jocelyn and Joe, for guiding us through. And thank you, Anna. That was pretty stunning. And I think we all learned something pretty amazing, but we now all really want summer to get here and certainly <laughs> get out for some fresh air. I think that's the theme. Uh, I want to thank everyone for all your great conversations and chat as well. Such wonderful dialogue. Actually, some of it came from my on hanging on to ask you a whole bunch of questions on and so i think you might have a new student for your workshops coming excellent. up excellent i love uh, it when i love it when people interact so thank you guys all for you know questions and chats and all that we'll capture all of that for you anna and send it over to you definitely you. visit anna on his website also check out our website with the whalingmuseum.org you can find sailing america as well as all of our other publications You'll also be able to find a recorded version of this conversation tomorrow that will give you a link to our YouTube channel. And you can certainly come back and check out all of our programming and, and uh, events. We're so happy that you could spend some time with us on a Tuesday night and hope that it gave you a good, fun escape. We definitely wish you all continued good health and just express our deep appreciation for joining us. So thank you very much and good night. Yes, thank you and good night. Thanks a lot.